Andrea, thanks for joining me today. Hi, thank you for having me. I'm very excited to, to have this conversation. Yes, you know, a much needed conversation. And I think before we get into what we want to connect up on today and, and chat about, I need to bring up Jane the Virgin just a little bit because <laughs> I think it's going to be such a nice segue into our conversation. The role that you played as Yamara and the mom that she was, I think is what we wished we had as a mom, most of us. As, yeah. you know, And not to put her moms down. My mom was a single mom and did an amazing job. But mm -hmm. it's just what you created as that purse, that character, and also the mom that we want to be, that confident mom. But we all struggle so much. So that's why I wanted to bring it up, because I think that there's that battle internally, right? And you talk a lot about that in your book. So let's start on um, how was it playing that role? And was it ever a sort of learning opportunity for you to rethink about your own life as well? Uh, well, playing the role of Siomara meant a lot to me because uh, this, as far as I was aware, this was the first uh, single Latina mom on television that was, you know, featured in, in, a, in a nice light, mm -hmm. you know, um, or featured at all. So I, I can relate to the role of Siomara because as, as a single mom, that's what I knew. That's when I was growing up. My mom was a single mom. That's what I saw. I saw my aunts raising their kids as single moms. Not an easy job. Then when I became a mom, I had a partner and then I ended up losing my partner, uh, which is a long story, mm -hmm. but I ended up like experiencing what that was like. And I said, but I have education and I have money and I have a nice place to live. And th these are things that I can give my children. And yet it is still so hard. I still question myself as a mom if I'm doing a good job. And I would even meet fans sometimes who would say, oh, I wish I was, I wish you were my mom. And I would think, oh my gosh, if you only knew, <laughs> I love playing Siomara. But I, I, I question myself every day as a mom in real life and whether or not I'm doing a good job. Yeah. Not easy. <laughs> and I think so many of us are struggling with that. I'm, I'm lucky that I get to speak to lots of moms and dads, but the moms are truly struggling right now. I have this weekly um, sort of poll on Instagram and it's called, am I the only one? And it's just so that parents or moms can put out like, am I the only one that feels this way or, or mm -hmm. had a child that did this? Because sometimes we feel alone in this journey. And yeah. I have to say the a really big majority of moms are sharing that they feel lonely, that they don't feel they are enough, that they are not doing well as a mom, um, that they don't have a circle of friends to support them, just body struggles, everything. So, I, you know, I enjoyed reading about your journey and, and sort of how you've been going through this and, and how you worked through many things. When you talk about the otherness is our strength, where do we begin if, if a mom is listening to this and is truly feeling at the bottom of everything and, and can't see the light right now? Like, how do we begin that work? One of the things that I always, I don't know why it was like this as a kid, but I always kind of went inside to kind of figure out what can I do? What can I do? What is in my power to change if I don't like a certain situation or if I'm not feeling good about myself or if I, if I need something and I don't have it right now, what can I do to get it? What can I do to change? Um, even as a, as in when I was in high school, um, you know, I, I as a as a young child, I had experienced childhood trauma in in the sense of um, there was violence in the household, and then also um, I had been sexually abused by my stepfather at age six. Sorry. So I had a lot of things to work out, still working them out. Mm -hmm. um, and I ended up having to parent myself, uh, you know, in high school. And I and I went up to my mom and I said, "Mom, I need help. I need I need to speak to somebody." Um, and that sort of started the journey for me on self help in a lot of ways. And that was probably age seventeen or sixteen, something like that. And so um, I'm almost forgetting your question, but I it, it's more like I believe that. Um, you start by maybe journaling yeah. or you start by talking to a, a trusted. And when I say trusted, I mean a trusted friend, because sometimes we think someone's trusted and they're not. Mm. Um, turn to books, turn to podcasts, mm. uh, just start doing little things to just to to take care of yourself. And then you can take care of others. 
<laughs> the journaling part, I think, is a really powerful first step. And I like that you look inside first because there are questions that we can ask ourselves, I think, that will start that work. And just journaling, I had I had posted a podcast about this, just writing like something we're grateful for. I remember I started this on January 1st this year. And oh. within three weeks, I noticed I had never done this before. And within just three weeks, I noticed how I was writing the little things like I have three kids ages three, five and seven and the little moments where they like hugged me and I hadn't really yes. noticed that. So the days that were hard from being home with three kids were becoming just a tiny little bit easier because of those moments of gratitude, which I yes. hadn't noticed before. So I think journaling is a really good uh, and important first step. Yeah. And you know what? That reminds me. Um so part of manifesting Jane, and this is not in the book because there was there were a lot of stories, but um, there is a part in the book where I talk about where I was working in LA, working on a film before Jane the Virgin. And then I met with casting directors and I auditioned and the story gets told in, in the book. But one of the, the reason, things that I did while I was in LA was I was struggling with um, a lot of self-doubt and feeling like I wasn't getting ahead in my career and issues in my marriage and a, a whole a whole slew of things. And um, so at the time, Brene Brown was doing an online journaling course. It was it was art journaling with with uh, Oprah's life class. And I looked at the dates and it was like six weeks and it exactly fell within the dates that I'd be working on this film. And I was going to be by myself. I wouldn't have the kids around. So I was in LA working on this art journaling course. And one of the uh, exercises that Brene Brown gave us to do was to walk around our home. And I did this when I got back to, uh, back to New York, walk around our home and take pictures of mundane, ordinary things that give you some sort of joy or pleasure mm -hmm. or, or something. And it doesn't even have to be joy or pleasure, but just something like sometimes, you know, you're just lucky that you have a roof over your head, you know, like just, and, and we can sometimes like we only stop to celebrate the big, wonderful yes, moments. Exactly. Well, exactly. And we take pictures of the big, wonderful moments, mm -hmm. but we don't take pictures of the ordinary things. And so, um, uh, it was a great exercise for me. It really made me appreciate myself as a mom and my home and my 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 time with my children. For example, um, I would beat myself up mentally, internally, when I didn't clean up um, the holiday decorations. <laughs> I've had this discussion with a friend. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I so, can't wait. <laughs> So I, I would feel like a, a loser, like what was wrong with me that I couldn't get rid of. So I had these Halloween decorations out after Thanksgiving. Oh my gosh. They were on the table and they were kind of cool Halloween decorations. So anyway, I, I decided to take a picture of it because I looked at this Hall Halloween decorations and I said, how lucky am I that I have a home where I can, and I have the luxury of money and time that I can set up some Halloween decorations for my kids to enjoy. Mm. How lucky am I? So I took a picture of it and um, and I created a collage of all the things that I did. And so one of the things was that it said, the title was Halloween decorations after Thanksgiving. Yeah, that was <laughs> what I was thankful for. And then another one was like the coffee pot on my stove or the look of my cat looking up at me with big, uh, big eyes because he was hungry, you know? And I just did all these things and it, it really made me appreciate my time as a mom, because it can be so stressful, <laughs> you know, and then you feel like you're not winning, but you know, you are, look at all the things you get, you get done in a day. I know we are superheroes really, when you think Absolutely. about it, the amount of stuff, but we're just so hard on ourselves. We just, we are, like you said, like sometimes even not just cleaning up like holiday stuff, but we look at our home at the end of the day, we don't have energy left. And we're like, I need to clean this house because it's a disaster. Right. Well, here's the thing. My, here's what my therapist would say. And this is, I love my therapist. <laughs> I gave her acknowledgement at the end I of the saw, yes. I love her so much. <laughs> so um, she would say, well, who is, who told you, or what's that voice? Where is that voice? Who's the voice that told you you're not good enough? Who's the voice that said, you're you're not lovable enough or pretty enough or smart enough or all these things and then like we deep dive into that and I know exactly who that where that voice came from and I'm still working through it 
but it helps me to to heal and to get better and to stop beating myself up so much and to be easier on my kids because then I end up projecting my own fears yes. anxiety onto my children and then I end up doing the very thing to them that I got done to me that's kind of got me struggling as an adult right mm. so I think it's just really important to go inside and figure it out and sometimes it's really scary and and painful and a lot of times we don't go in that direction because of the the anxiety and the pain the fear of the pain and but honestly I just know personally that that's what's going to set you free when you go when you go through that hard time, that dark night of the soul, whatever it is, and you go towards the thing that scares you, that's where your best life is going to be. I love that. And you know, you're right, though, about the past. I think for myself, come, becoming a mom, I was like, I know the science of emotions, I, you know, tantrums are I, they, I'm fine with those. But I only realized after becoming a parent, and then I changed everything about Curious Neuron, was that I was focusing on the child and saying, all we need to know is everything that child needs, and we'll be good as parents. And I was so wrong. What I needed to know is everything about myself, which I didn't. And yes. I think that's the hardest part of becoming a parent is you realize yeah. I was living life fine before this little human being came into my life. And now I'm seeing all these dark parts about me or like these thoughts. And mm -hmm. I didn't have them before. So, you know, and, and I had to dig back into my own past mm -hmm. and then realize what I was taking into my parenting from my childhood and what I didn't want. Did you have to do a bit of that? Like, I think of the relationship that you paint with your mom, you know, in this book, and she seemed like such a strong character to have and such a powerful and positive character mm -hmm. person in your life. Is is that what the story, like, is that, did I get the right picture of your mom? And is, is this what you tried to bring into your parenting or were there certain things you had to work through? Um, well, I mean, there, here's the thing. I, I realize all parents are human beings. And when we're children, we put them on pedestals and we, 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 we kind of make them like a, a God, God-like in some way um, and hold them up to um, a standard that's really not um, attainable. Yeah. And then they inevitably fall off the pedestal and disappoint us <laughs> because they are human. Yes. And so um, I have, I have issues that I'm still struggling with around my mom. Um, and which obviously I won't go into detail about, but, um, what I have been able to do is look at the good stuff that she's done as well mm -hmm. and, and realize that how that actually did help me. And so I had the parents that I was supposed to have, I have that faith. Like those were like the customized parents that Andrea needed for her journey in life. And then I'm the parent for my child and their father what they need in life. Um, but what I will say is that I definitely have made some, made a lot of changes. Like one thing is um, I apologize to my children when I know that I've, I've crossed a boundary, I haven't done something that I could have done better. Mm -hmm. And I think what ends up happening is uh, in the older generations, it was like, you have to respect me, right? The word respect is upheld and then it's like it takes you it takes your voice away you yeah. you have no sense of autonomy or self because you can't go against because then you're being disrespectful um now of course I, i'm a latina mom so i <laughs> i definitely will not tolerate I, I know how to draw a boundary with my children but i also believe that if my child tries to draw a boundary with me or is trying to speak up and maybe I have truly crossed a boundary. Like I, I want to lead by example. And that's one thing I talk about in my book is that I want to lead by example. I want my children to see me striving to be my best self, whatever that is. And, you know, I can't say to my kids, don't talk, don't speak this way or don't say that or whatever. And then, but then I go and do the same thing. So instead I want them to see me, I go to therapy. I talk about what I, what I do in therapy. I, they see me uh, I say, I'm meditating now, don't knock on the door, or um, they see me going to yoga class. I've taken both of my children on retreats. I, I told you about the, you saw the cold plunge in, in Instagram. They were with you? Only my son, just my son. And yeah. I, I didn't post my son because he's a teenager and he didn't want me to, you know, no, no. all his friends <laughs> follow me. So it was just be like, eh. yeah. not, not so, not so great for him, but, um, but it's great that he like, came. 
I actually did that for him. Mm. I did it for him because his father passed a year and a half ago mm. and his father really loved Wim Hof. Mm. And, you know, you know, it's supposed to help you with depression and all kinds of things. And I know my son was doing it on his own. He was doing cold showers. He was doing Wim Hof breathing. And I wanted to find a way to connect to him and, and something that connected him to his father to help him take care of himself. So this is like, again, leading through example for my children is don't say, okay, go talk to a therapist or go journal. Like, you know, I'm like, oh no, I do it. Mm -hmm. I go to therapy. I journal. I do these things. Let's do this together. I ended up taking my daughter to Kripalu up in uh, the Berkshires, uh, which is a spiritual retreat. And we did a whole thing, the uh, three day weekend, you know, and it was, this was me trying to empower my kids to take care of themselves to go within and take care of themselves. But most of us didn't get that kind of thing. Even if we had experienced trauma or, you know, something in our childhood mm -hmm. from what I was raised, the, the way that I was raised was, you know, you kind of ignore it. And if the parent ignores it long enough, maybe it'll disappear, you know? So yeah. I think I truly applaud you for the, what you're doing with your kids, because yeah. this is new. We never learned this. This is very different for us. I will say kudos to my mom as imperfect as she was as imperfect as I am as a mother or a human being, but she apologized to me once and I could say my entire childhood my mother wouldn't apologize and she would always have to be the person who was right and this was like a big complaint that I had but she apologized to me and about the most important thing and that was about around my sexual abuse and how she apologized to me for not protecting me and not being there for me when she when um when I needed her huge I think I was 11 years old at that time huge she I, I've tried to share with her mom, you have no idea. I know you feel guilty about your parenting as a, as you know, when, when I was growing up, I know you, you know, you've made mistakes. I know all that, but that apology was huge. Mm -hmm. And so, um, I try, I do the same thing with my kids. I'm like, I, you're right. I'm wrong. I should never have said that or blah, blah, blah. You know, I, I will own up to, to things that I think are, are not right. And I think it's really important for them to see that. And it allows somebody to kind of move forward, right? Like to move with the healing and, and what the part, whatever they have to do to do the work, it allows that person by just hearing, I'm sorry, that's huge. Right. You mentioned boundaries. And I think that's something also that we struggle with as parents and our generation as well. Um, I, I just turned 40 uh, last week. And I would say that about three weeks, no, three years ago, that's when I started working on boundaries and what that meant for me and how important that was for my mental health. Did you experience the same thing? You touched on boundaries. I mean, I, I wasn't allowed to have boundaries as a child. And again, that's just what my mom knew. And she would always say in the mom and the dad, you don't have a right to have any, you know, input in anything that we're doing. Um, yeah. Yeah. Did you experience this as well? Uh, yeah. You know, because I grew up around physical abuse and it was physical abuse towards my mom. I had to learn as a teenager and I, and I touch on that as well in the book that I had to learn as a teenager. Um, to stand up for myself, basically, and not, uh, I, I didn't want to continue what I, the cycle that I had seen in my family, I didn't want to continue that. And so, but it got to the point where I had to like, sort of hit rock bottom and, and, and um, have a, a sort of wake up call and go, Oh, oh, is, is this what I want for my life? Is this you know, so that, so that was an example of, of boundary setting. And then the other boundary setting was sticking up for myself when I was bullied. Mm -hmm. uh, so all of those things. So I grew up kind of tough, like not everybody grows up like that. Um, but I'm, you know, I'm glad that I was able to set those boundaries, but I still struggle with boundaries as an adult because, because of some of the trauma I've gone through and because of some of the dynamics between me and my mom, you know, sometimes I'm afraid to speak up. Sometimes I'm afraid. It, it was a huge deal for me to write a book at all because it's like saying I have a voice, you know, it's saying I have something to say and that, and, and it's important, but then I would struggle and still struggle with the voice. Well, I like, even as I was writing the book, I would hear the voices say, oh, no one's going to be interested in what you're writing about. Mm -hmm. No one's going to buy the book. It was like, like all these like wonderful things. So harsh on myself. Um, so what was my point? Oh my gosh, I had a point. 
but your boundaries yeah and and you're uh, you boundaries. you spoke about when you were bullied as well and and mm. and the work yeah this this work that you're doing and that inner voice piece I, I could only imagine how hard it must have been during writing the book but having read it the story can help people feel less alone because we have so many so many of us go through something similar or can connect with parts of your story and I think it's really important to share your story yeah and 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 so I've been doing this type of therapy with my therapist called the internal family system hmm. I always get confused between system and structure and it's this concept that um, as children or even as adults if we've gone through a very dramatic or traumatic experience uh, we end up having to in order to survive section off uh aspects of our personality in, in order to get through whatever we're going through. So for example, when I was getting bullied and then uh, my boyfriend being abusive towards me, like at that age in my teens, I uh, there was a part that came in that said no. And it was like the sentry, the guard at the gate, like no, the protector. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that part has is still part of, of me you know, so part of as I grow up. And then there's other parts, you know, like everyone can relate to the inner child, everyone can relate to the ego, these parts that come into play that where you you ended you the, the boundary setting is really like, for yeah. me, the boundary setting I learned from this guard. But sometimes as an adult, that guard still comes into play. And, and it could be a little over the top as an adult. <laughs> Or there's the parts of, of me that want to protect me from being shamed, from being embarrassed out in public. You know, no one's going to believe that I can write or or all the insecurities I have around that. That was me, just a little, a young part of me trying to protect me. Let's not go there. That's dangerous. Don't go in that direction. Um, and so through the therapy, I learned... Uh, I've learned about these different parts and I, 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 it kind of helps me to pull back and get a, an aspect of it and say, do I want the little eight year old Andrea driving the ship today? Do I want the 16 year old Andrea driving the ship today? You know, cause I know that through my, um, through my therapy, I've learned about these different parts of myself. So that's one of the ways I've learned how to draw boundaries. <laughs> <laughs> you one um, part that marked me is when you talked about the moment when you were in the plane and you were flying to LA um, for I believe it was I forget the name of it, but when there's like this, yes, exactly. And you talk about how it was the sleep of faith, or that you 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 know you went for it, and at that time your husband had said like go for it, I've got this. You know his father, I believe had just passed there and yes, his, it was, his parent, his father his, just passed. Yeah. And it was a difficult moment. And, but there was this opportunity for you and, and you were able to take that opportunity and go for it, which ended up, you know, being a good thing, obviously. Yeah. Um, but I, I'd love for you to share a bit of that and, and what was going through your mind, because I know that there are parents and, and moms that are listening that sometimes we're afraid to take that risk and to really go out of that comfort zone or to do something that might not necessarily be the best mom thing, right? Like I, I think about myself too. I um, left to go to Miami for the first time. I left my kids in seven years. I had never left them alone. And I remember sitting on that plane and my thoughts weren't exactly like yours. They were more of like, what am I doing? Why am I doing this? What's the point? Why am I going to go pitch this thing that I'm doing? Like, I should have just stayed home. What if something happens? But your thoughts, your, from what I read in the book, it was more of like, I, this is good. Like, it's a good thing. Right. Or like, how was it for you? Yes. That well, so, so leading up to that day that I got, I got onto that plane, there were 10 years before that, where I held myself back from going to LA for pilot season, because I was afraid that I wouldn't do well. And, and actually, and maybe 15 years prior to that, I had gone to LA for the first time by myself to try and do pilot season and I was so lonely out there and it was so hard to get started. It was the beginning of my career. So it was really, really hard to get start started. And it was very isolating in LA. It can be still isolating. So I came back kind of like feeling like I had failed, like I didn't do well. And actually my dad did kind of say, oh, you're back so early, like and kind of insinuated that I I gave up or something, but that's a whole other story. Mm -hmm. So, um, but, but that added to my own insecurity, right? So for 10 years, I held myself back and would only do pilot season in New York. 
but I felt like I kept hitting a wall, hitting a wall. I wasn't, or a ceiling, like I wasn't getting it far enough into my career. I wasn't where I thought it would be at age. I had my daughter at, I was 35. So like by age 40, I, I wasn't where I thought I would be. Mm. So through a series of, of different situations going on in my relationship and, and, and all this, I, I just decided, I said, I knew in my heart of hearts that I needed to go. I, I just needed to go to LA. I needed to break out of my comfort zone. I knew that I was dancing the same dance step every time. So of course I was going to continue to get the same results. Mm -hmm. And so um, it was 10 years of holding myself back. So in answer to your question, I had a lot of regret during those 10 years and holding yourself back in fear is a very uh, uncomfortable feeling. Mm -hmm. It's a terrible feeling. So to know, so for me, it was like, I'm going to go, I'm going to go slay this dragon because even if I come back with nothing, I'm going to know I at least face my fears right. mm. and that would be, you know, a win for me. And so, um, so yeah, so in, in answer to your question, I dealt with a lot of guilt, uh, leaving my children, um, I think my, my son was seven at the time and my daughter, my, yeah, my daughter was 10. And, and I took a lot of pride in being their mom and being there for them. I wanted to protect them, just like you say. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to be the one to like really kind of guide them and do all the things. But um, I think it was really important for them to see me do something that I was scared to do. And then look at all the wonderful things that, that have come from it. Thank goodness you, you took that risk and you went and, <laughs> you know, I, I, I think to a lot of mom, I think about the moms that I speak with and I do think that we struggle, you know, with taking those risks because though that self-talk kind of takes control and it's like, what are you doing? You need to be a mom first or don't take this move in your career that might lead to you being homeless often. Or, you know, we, we see ourselves as the mom first. It's such a hard battle and it shouldn't be a battle, right? But also we're battling on on um, subconscious programming. <laughs> yes. We're battling exactly. subconscious programming that as moms, we're supposed to be all sacrificing. Mm -hmm. Like the Madonna or whatever. Yes. Like we're supposed it's to true. be so virginal on top yeah. of that. I was like, well, how does she get pregnant? How yeah. does she have all those kids? Is she supposed to be vir virginal now? <laughs> I mean, I even remember feeling like I couldn't take certain roles as an actress anymore because I was a mom now, mm -hmm. like, you know, sexy roles. Yeah. Like, because, well, I'm a mom now. I'm like, but wait a minute, where, where, where's that message coming from? Right. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> you know? So I think like we're, we're, we're battling with as females, there's uh, this subliminal expectations mm -hmm. of us to be self-sacrificing um, and to be, uh, dedicated to our families, to our husbands and our children. And that's just what the definition of a good woman is, right. you know, and I don't think that's true. <laughs> we forget to love ourselves and we forget that the self-care part or that piece of mm -hmm. who we are today is really about the love. It's not about this. I always tell parents, like, of course, it's good to get out and the, the spa day is great, but the self-care is really the work on yourself and how much you love yourself and that you feel worthy enough to love yourself and for others. Yeah, exactly. It's a, it's a daily uh, practice mm. of loving yourself and what that looks like could be sleeping in an extra 15 minutes, you know, <laughs> yes. I, gosh, you know, the lack of sleep you get as a, uh, with young ones. Mm -hmm. um, but actually you still get a lack of sleep with, I have teenagers still get a lack of sleep by really? the way. Sorry, really? sorry. No, sorry. no, I thought you were going to tell me it gets better. No, no. <laughs> It gets better on some levels, but yeah. you know, like my daughter's 18 and she'll be out. She's driving now. And then she'll, and she's like, come on, I'm coming home. I don't know what time. I'm like, oh no. You know what time? <laughs> oh, it's my mom would wait up until I came home. Yeah. So whatever my curfew was, she was always awake. <laughs> I get yeah, it. Yeah. Mm. So, um, but anyway, the, the subliminal programming mm. that we, we have going on in our in our minds and 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 that's why i think going inside figuring things out going to therapy uh you know journaling all these things help you to kind of get become more aware get more online because the when you know better most likely you'll do better for a parent who's listening to this and feels like okay I, you know i think i learned a couple things from this conversation but now how do we 
move, set them forward and say, here's what you need to start doing tomorrow that might lead to easier days, you know, following that? Well, <laughs> I don't know if this is so directly tied to what you're asking, but this is one of the, there's a book out there that helped me so much in my career and in my life in general, mm -hmm. and it's called The War of Art. And it was, it's written by Stephen Pressfield. It was originally, um, he originally started to write the book for other writers because he realized all these struggles he would have to create art would, you know, he thought, oh, he kind of figured out, figured it out in a way and he wanted to help other artists too. And so one of my acting teachers years ago recommended this book to me, I got it and it made all the difference. And I honestly think that Jane the Virgin is one of the reasons why, um, uh, I mean, yeah, it came to fruition is because of this book, because it really? it made me more conscious. It made me see what I was doing. And so what he realized as he was writing the book was he says, oh, all of these blocks that we have as writers actually apply to any human being on earth. Any human who wants to pursue a higher endeavor, including being uh, an awesome freaking mom, um, uh, has a certain amount of resistance and blocks that they need to get through. And he he gets into it and it's such an easy read. You could read some some chapters are a paragraph. Oh and it's so insightful. It's so it's just like golden nuggets of wisdom. And I think that it will help anyone who is wanting to be better at whatever it is they want to do. I love that. I haven't read that, but I somebody told me about that book. I have to look into it. Um, wonderful. Cannot tell you how and wonderful. We do have blocks. I think that we do, no matter whether we're a parent or not, or in our careers, you know, I, I see it now trying to run, even whether it's Curious Neuron or whatever I'm doing, there's so many blocks that we encounter. And 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 even in our, you know, friendships and relationships, I, I, all of that comes into play. That's so so I think that's really, really good advice. I need to read it. <laughs> yeah. He talks about relationships and how other people really? can be our blocks and um, he breaks it down. He breaks it down so wonderfully. And, and so even just to write our otherness is our strength, that book helped me because I would remember things he said in the book and that's how it helped me to get through. So like one of the blocks I would have, you know, getting past that voice of, uh, um, what am I going to write? I can't write. I'm not a writer. You know, I'm, I promised myself, I said, Oh, you know what? I know that voice. He talks about that voice in the book. And I said, if I can circumvent that, if I just say I'm going to show up to my computer three or four days a week for five or 10 minutes, I won. I won. I don't have to do any much more than that. And then and inevitably, I'll, of course, spend a lot more time, but some more time writing than other days. But I I, I at least set myself up for a win mm -hmm. and I wasn't going to end up beating myself up because I didn't write like pages and pages that day. I set myself up for a win bypass that voice and said, well, we could do five, five minutes. You, the voice can't have a problem with five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so. that. But that reminds me of the book called, uh, atomic habits. Have you read oh, yeah. that one? Oh yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. I know and, that book too. Yeah. What you're talking about reminds me of that because it's like, like exercising or whatever habit you're trying to bring into your life, make it small. Like we, we keep telling ourselves like, Oh, I want to work out or I want to do something and mm -hmm. I'll, I'll work out two hours a day, you know, six days a week, but you can't do that. I think it's exactly. just showing up on the mat, <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. To start off with is, is a good start. Yes. Baby steps for sure. Um, yeah, I love that book. And so, you know, really, I think it's just a matter of looking for help, whether it's in a book, a podcast, um, a movie, your therapist, your friends is looking for reaching out for help. Yeah, that community piece is another one too, friends. I And I know that some moms don't have that, but there's always some way to find, you know, sometimes there's some mom groups online mm -hmm. or some sort of way to con connect because you feel less alone in, in those difficult moments. Yeah, I still struggle with aloneness ever since COVID. I don't have an office to report to anymore. So like my, my office being like an audition where it's, or an acting class. And mm. um, like today I had an audition on Zoom. <laughs> On Zoom, the oh, in my yeah. home. Yeah, I, I haven't done an in-person um, audition for years now, like three or four years. Yeah, does, out of curiosity, how does that feel? Because I know when it comes to meetings on 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 Zoom, mm -hmm. I don't find that we're as productive as when we're in person. Like we try to oh, I think, like yeah. and creative. Does it feel the same for auditions? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we'll get out of it at some point. Yes. But that's so hard. <laughs> it is. It is. But I get I get the like social aspect. It's, it is hard. It can really get to you. Yeah. If you spend too much time alone. Andrea, mm-hmm. thank you for chatting with me. Uh, I Everybody who's listening, I will put links in the show notes to the book that you mentioned, but your book as well, The Our Otherness is Our Strength. And it truly is for you. And I appreciate that you shared your story with all of us. Great. Thank you. I appreciate you you wanting to interview me. So thank, thank you. you.